morning, we're going to be talking about all kinds of invasive insects that you may find in your woodland. And I know some people may still be joining us, but I have a lot to talk about, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So first of all, I just wanted to remind you that this class is being recorded. So by participating, you are giving your consent to being a part of this recording. And I have my compadre, Ashley Bodkins, who is manning the chat today. So she's going to try and answer your questions in the chat. And if she uh, needs to, uh, Ashley, you can interrupt me to, um, you know, at appropriate times to ask me some questions from the chat. If we start to run low on time, I might um, say, let's say the, ch the uh, questions to the end. I do have a lot of information to share with you today. And I'm anticipating that it may be, well, it's gonna be more than an hour, hopefully less than an hour and a half. But um, certainly uh, if we, I will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. And uh, I have no problem with hanging around for a while to answer your questions. So uh, Ashley, maybe we should try and limit the chat, the chat a little bit uh, and let's see. Uh, Ashley, would you like to say hi to everybody? Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Sherry had, does a wonderful job on this subject, so I'm so excited to hear her, her talk about it. I learn something new every time. So Sherry, I will limit the chat questions. I'll try to answer what I can, and I'll also put our emails in there in case we don't get to somebody's questions, they can follow up with us. Excellent, thank you so much, I appreciate that. And uh, so Ashley is our Master Gardener Coordinator in Garrett County. I am the Master Gardener Coordinator and uh, agriculture educator in Allegheny County here in Maryland. Okay, so like I said, we've got a lot to cover today. I, I am going to turn off my camera for now. Just wanted to let you know I am a real live human being here, but uh, save bandwidth, I'm gonna turn that off and uh, we will go ahead and get started. So let's see, go to the next. So we like to let everybody know that uh, we are part of the University of Maryland through the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. We are Extension. And so we're gonna get started on this topic. So the invasive insects I'm gonna to cover today are mostly exotic invasives. So I'm gonna to talk today about gypsy moths, hemlock woolly adelgid, emerald ash borer. We have a new insect on the scene called spotted lanternfly. And then if we're not running over too long, I will talk briefly about the southern pine beetle, which is actually a native insect, but it, it can have some very negative effects on your woodland. So first off is gypsy moth. Now I became intimately acquainted with the problem of gypsy moths in North America when I joined Extension in, 2000 in 2007. And I was helping uh, extension to do gypsy moth surveying in Garrett County in conjunction with Maryland Department of Agriculture in order to create uh, spray blocks for Maryland Depart Department of Agriculture to help control the gypsy moth outbreak that was occurring in our state at that time. But um, if we go way back in history, the gypsy moth was first introduced from Europe in 1869 by a French scientist named Leopold Truvelo. He lived in Medford, Massachusetts, and he was trying to identify native silkworms that might be used for silk production in this country. And so in the midst of his experimenting, some of his gypsy moth caterpillars got loose. He did alert local entomologists, but no action was taken at that time. So about 20 years later, we have our first major outbreak of gypsy moths in Massachusetts. And at about that time, uh, Mr. Truvelo, I think decided it was safer to go back to France. So he moved back to France. Since then, the gypsy moth has been spreading, uh, especially throughout the new Northeast. And uh, I th in the mid eighties is when we actually see it occurring in Maryland. Now, the gypsy moth is about the worst invasive forest insect in the Eastern United States, especially on oaks. They do have cyclic populations, which means uh, they have a cycle of the population building to 
uh, outbreak status where you're just inundated with gypsy moths. And some study shows that that cycle can be kind of like a 10 year period of cycle uh, to outbreak and then the population drops and then it builds. So <clears throat> they have a, um, a high rate of reproduction. They are adaptable to many host plants and they are adaptable, adaptable to many climates, which uh, lends to them being an invasive species. Also the fact that they don't have a lot of native um, diseases or predators, but that is beginning to change now. So gypsy moths prefer oak trees, but you will also find them on very many other different apple or species. You've got apples, sweet gum, basswood, grain, white birch, poplar, willow, hickory, hawthorn, etc. cetera. Um, when you're in an outbreak situation, you can also find the adult caterpillars on evergreens, such as hemlock, pine, spruces, and cedars. They don't prefer these, but when food sources become scarce, they will move to these kinds of trees. Now, gypsy moths tend to avoid ash, tulip tree, sycamore, black walnut, catalpa, locust, hollies, and shrubs such as mountain laurel and rhododendrons. Now this is a map of the current distribution, well as of 2019, uh, of gypsy moth in the United States. And as you can see from the red and gray, it is throughout the Northeast, Maine to North Carolina, and going west to Illinois and Michigan up north and, and uh, Wisconsin. And we've got a spot over in Kansas that also has a population of gypsy moths. Now this is the quarantine area map. I put this in just to alert you. If you are a forest owner um, and you want to harvest your trees and you're going to ship them off someplace, something that you need to do is, or at least your manager, the, the loggers are gonna have to check, see if there is a quarantine in the states to where they want to to sell your lumber and they will have to then fill out paperwork and do inspections to make sure that there are no gypsy moth egg masses on the lumber that you are shipping. And this also applies to nursery stock as well. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. Um, when we do have invasive species, many times states will have quarantines on um, various forest products depending on the particular uh, invasive species and you need to check on that before shipping or moving any kind of forest product and that could include um, nursery stock as well as boards, lumber, firewood, okay? And sometimes there are also federal quarantines. All right, so the gypsy moth in Maryland, they spread naturally south into Maryland and the first egg mass was identified in actually in 1971. The first uh, extensive defoliation occurred in 1981. We had another outbreak at about 1990. So we had a, over 133,000 acres that were defoliated in 2007 and eight. I was a witness to that defoliation. So we had 68,000 acres defoliated in 2007. Um, it was better in 2008. The population was starting to crash and come down and we only had 19,000 acres defoliated. Most of that defoliation occurred in the western counties of Allegheny, Garrett, Washington, and Frederick. So here is a pictorial of the basic life cycle of gypsy moths, and the reason why I am going to talk about the life cycle of these different pests is so that you can identify them, and this is all part of a strategy of management called integrated pest management. And the idea here is to uh, gain as much knowledge about this, the pest that you are encountering as possible. It will help you in making wise decisions and how to best manage uh, the pest on your property. When you can identify the different life stages, it will help you to know, you know, is this a vulnerable life stage or not? So basically, um, well, it depends on the pest, but Sometimes it's going to be a lot easier to control a pest if you can find an egg mass and scrape it off a tree and get rid of it rather than waiting for all those 
caterpillars to hatch out of the egg mass and then have to control the, the caterpillars. Likewise, um, you know, adults are a lot harder to control because they can fly and move around a lot more easily. So it's just really important to understand uh, the pests that you're working with so you can make good decisions. So with gypsy moths, uh, egg masses over winter and the young caterpillars tend to hatch out in April and May and then the caterpillars are feeding through June and then um, they will go into their next stage of development which is like a cocoon, it's the pupil stage and then in August that's when you're going to see adult moths emerge. So I'm going to just spend a little time on each of these stages. So this is what a, a newly hatched out gypsy moth is going to look like. You see the egg masses here on the left side of the screen. Uh, they can be different colors. It could be a light tan color, um, kind of bleached out, uh, a more medium tan, or even a dark brown I have seen. And these caterpillars are fairly small, maybe uh, 1 16th of an inch. And uh, they will climb to the top of the trees. And if it's really crowded conditions. They may uh, spin a little silk, and, which would get caught in the wind and which would blow them to neighboring trees, which they can then begin to, to feed on. They may also do this if the tree that they hatch out on is not an oak tree, it's not a preferred host. We call this method of dispersal ballooning. So the caterpillars are gonna go through six stages of development, we call that an instar. And you can see from this picture, this is a later instar, and you have the characteristic red and blue raised tubercles on the, the caterpillar. Now those hairs on the caterpillar can be very irritating to some people. Um, you can have allergic reactions and it cause itching and, and such. So, you know, you have to watch that. Now the behavior of these caterpillars is that they crawl down the trees at dawn to rest and they hide during the day. And then in the evening, they will climb back up into the tree canopy to feed. When the trees become defoliated, then they will crawl down the trees and move away to find another tree to feed on. So this is a picture of a cocoon. Um, the cocoons are pretty inconspicuous, although you know they are fairly large, maybe uh, an inch or so. And they're gonna tend to, to be found in cracks and crevices on trees. Um, and this is gonna occur mid-June through early July. Now, um, when you have an outbreak situation, you know, the, the caterpillars start, you know, choosing just about any old place to pupate. So you could find them on cars, trailers, you know, on your house, all different kinds of places. Now, this stage of development lasts for one to two weeks. At that point, then the adult moths hatch out You'll notice that the males and females have different coloration. The male on the right here, he is more gray and he does fly. The female does not fly and um, she will put out pheromones and the male will fly in search of females, which when he finds a female, they will mate and then she will lay the egg mass on the tree and then both the male and female will die. They do not feed during this life stage, but the thing with the egg masses is it could be as many as 1,000 eggs in one egg mass. These egg masses will overwinter to the following spring when they will hatch. Now this is in 2007, uh, in June, I believe, in Garrett County. And you can see this is an outbreak situation. The trees are just covered with caterpillars. And this is what it looks like. There were so many caterpillars on this one stretch of road in Garrett County that um, there was just smears of dead caterpillars on the road from the cars running over them. It's just incredible. And in July, this is what the forest looked like. It looks like the dead of winter. They have been completely defoliated. And here is a view of a valley um, from New Germany Road. And you can see the brown areas on the hillsides. Those are just completely deforested areas. This is an aerial view in Garrett County taken by Biff Thompson. He works for MDA. He was kind enough to share this slide with me. And you can see vast areas of defoliation. This was 2007. So how does gypsy moth feeding affect my trees? 
get I would get a lot of questions about this. So people want to know if their trees are going to die. So if you if your tree has 50 to 60 percent of foliation, there's a higher probability um, that this stress is going to lead to mortality. Defoliation, of course, stresses the tree. And hopefully your tree will not try to refoliate. It won't try to put out more leaves because if it does, it's going to deplete resources from the tree, uh, which is going to make it weaker going into the following growing season. And when the tree doesn't have as many uh, resources stored in its roots, it is less able to fend off pest insects or diseases. Now you may also have site issues, um, environmental issues that are going to compound the stress to your trees. You could have drought, you could have uh, floods, like you could have inundation of rain, uh, soil compaction, poor sites, all these things will compound the problem. So uh, defoliation like two years in a row or more basically is a death sentence to your trees. Um, and a combination of any of these factors quite often leads to death in one to three years. So what's the best way, best way to control gypsy moths? Well, you might find this picture pretty humorous, but um, this is a picture of what people uh, used to do, like when the, the gypsy moths first broke out in the late 1800s. The first idea was, well, we'll get a whole bunch of people, we'll go out there and try and scrape off all the gypsy moths, egg masses that we can find, and we're going to try and control the spread that way. Well, as you can well see, um, that did not end up controlling the population and it has spread throughout the Northeast. Now, given it has taken 100 years to get to the point where it is, but um, really this is not um, a logical or um, <laughs> probably not the best way to try and do things. Now, I will say if you have a specimen tree in your yard that you want to protect, you will want to try and scrape off as many gypsy moth egg masses as possible. Bear in mind though, if you have a really tall tree, there is no way that you're going to get up into the top of that tree and remove every egg mass. And egg masses can have up to a thousand eggs in them. When I first started doing um, the gypsy moth surveying in 2007, I remember going to this one homeowner's property and um, he said to me as I was speaking to him, he's like, you and the other MDA personnel need to get out on my property and everybody else's property and scrape off these egg masses. And I just looked at him with disbelief. And um, you know, when you have thousands of trees that are, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet tall, this is just an impossibility. So th this is um, not practical. Okay, so what are some ways that we can try and manage um, or minimize the impact of gypsy moths on our property? Well, there are all kinds of options out there. Do nothing is not gonna minimize, but that, that is uh, an option. There are natural predators out there that can help um, reduce gypsy moth populations, as well as pesticides, tree barriers. You can do some physical removal on specimen, specimen trees, uh, and there are some silvicultural options, and I will just talk about each of these. So some of the natural population controls for gypsy moths uh, are through our uh, natural species, such as small rodents, shrews, raccoons, uh, predatory insects, such as wasps, flies, ground beetles, ants, and there are several bird species. They may either eat the caterpillars or the eggs. And um, you can try to encourage especially the mammals and birds on your property by creating habitat within your woodland. Could be allowing, you know, having some snags, which would be habitat for squirrels and other birds, or it could be some ground cover and uh, brush piles, which would encourage small mammals. Now, another natural population control is the NPV, virus, which is nucleopolyhydrosis virus, this is actually naturally occurring. Uh, this is most effective when you have an outbreak situation. It's kind of like coronavirus. It spreads very easily when you have high population densities. 
And this can really knock a, a population of gypsy moths down. Another natural control is Entomophaga mimiga, which is a fungus. This fungus is pretty specific to attacking caterpillars. And what, it, what happens is this fungus will start to grow on the, the caterpillar and eventually it will kill that caterpillar. And in that process, it will release spores, which will then um, be deposited on other caterpillars and kill them. Also, very cold temperatures, uh, minus 20 or more for three days or so may kill eggs, egg masses, so that's helpful. And if we have cold rainy weather in the spring as the um, caterpillars are hatching out, that also can lead to a lot of death in the caterpillars. It may be because it's encouraging the fungus Entomophaga mimiga. Now, I have included some information about the Maryland Department of Agriculture Suppression Program for those of you who are Maryland residents. And if you have woodland, uh, you probably want to be familiar with this. You know, if you were ever in an outbreak situation, just so you understand how Maryland Department of Agriculture um, plans its spray program and who it includes. So, there is a ranking system for this. And so I'm just, I'm not gonna go over the details of it, but just to tell you uh, what kinds of properties they typically spray. So they will typically spray high density residential areas, pu uh, public summer recreation areas, historic land or landmark or scenic, uh, say parks, and they could be publicly owned or, um, owned by the state, okay? Um, and then for those of you who have uh, woodland on your property and you have a forest management plan, you are part of that, uh, but you are um, the lowest rank as far as um, how they would decide who to spray. And then another criteria that they look at is the actual uh, population density of gypsy moth. So of course, if you have really high population density, you're going to be, you know, it's going to give you more points towards being, um, you know, at the top of the list for spraying. And also they do tend to spray state forests. Okay, so as part of the suppression program for Maryland, um, as, as far as uh, spraying, um, I, I think it might be the next slide, but uh, two chemicals that they use would be Bt and Dimlin, and I'll talk about that more. But also something else Maryland has done is they have actually released this fungus, Entomophaga mimiga, in different locations throughout the state in conjunction with um, USDA. And that was in 1991 and also 95. The results are unpredictable, uh, but there are populations of um, this fungus that are surviving throughout the state, maybe even spreading. Um, but how well they do depends on whether or not the, sp the spring is wet. Okay, so a little more about this fungus. It was introduced from Japan in 1910 and then first detected in the Northeast in 1989. Um, it, it can help to control both small and large populations of gypsy moths, but it's very dependent on whether or not you have wet weather. Now the pesticides that Maryland Department of Ag has used, as I mentioned, was Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacteria, a variety of Kirstaki. They may also use Dimlin. Maryland has never used Gypcheck. Other states have. Gypcheck is actually the NPV virus. And um, so most of the time the spraying is going to be using Bt because it is very specific to caterpillar larva and it has to be ingested by the caterpillar in order to work. So this way they're reducing um, collateral damage, so to speak. Now Dimlin is a little more uh, broad spectrum. It does uh, it, it messes with the insect's ability to molt. It's a chitinase inhibitor. So it will kill more than, uh, than gypsy moths or caterpillars. Um, 
but it has to be ingested. But dimling cannot be used near water sources. So for the most part, Maryland Department of Agriculture uses BT. Now, if you wanna treat specimen trees in your yard, you could use a neonicot, well, in Maryland, you cannot use a neonicotinoid. If you're outside of the state of Maryland, you have to check with your, your laws. But neonicotinoid chemicals such as imidacloprid and dinotefuron are very good at controlling forest pest insects. They are systemic. There are different ways to apply them. The easiest way for a homeowner to apply them is through a soil drench or um, spraying it on the bark of your tree. It's called a basal bark application. Now in Maryland, homeowners do not have access to these chemicals. You must have a, uh, a license to apply this chemical. If you are a private applicator, say you are a farmer and you already have your private applicator license, you could buy um, imidacloprid or dinotefuron and apply it. Otherwise, as a homeowner, you're gonna have to hire someone from uh, a tree company to uh, treat your trees. Now, you can, as a homeowner without a license, you can use chemicals such as BT, which would be sprayed to the canopy of your tree or seven. Now, I like to encourage people to use BT versus seven because BT is uh, very selective in what insects it kills whereas seven kills just about everything. And whenever you're using any kind of pesticide, the label is the law and you must read it in its entirety and follow its instructions. So uh, <clears throat> with seven, you'll find that seven and the chemical active ingredient that is carbaryl, uh, seven kills bees. And so there will be a bee warning on it that tells you you may not use this product when the plant that you are spraying it on is in bloom. So you cannot use seven when your tree or shrub is in bloom. Okay, so if you wanna try and control gypsy moths on your trees, on specimen trees, you know, like I said, it's not practical in a woodland setting, but you could do burlap bands. Uh, knowing that the behavior of the gypsy moth is to rest during the day, you can create a band of burlap around your tree and the gypsy moths will crawl in there and hide during the day. And also they may pupate there. So what you would need to do is uh, monitor this burlap band daily and kill the insects that you find in there. Another method would be tree banding with something like, uh, uh, what do you call that, tangle foot, <clears throat> which is something sticky that as the caterpillars crawl across that band, they're gonna get stuck in it. And then uh, you're gonna need to kind of uh, clear those insects out of there so it doesn't get you know, too many caterpillars stuck in there such that the, they actually form a bridge across the, the band and crawl across the, the other caterpillars. But um, you can use something like a tangle foot. You could use a petroleum jelly. These products should not be applied directly to tree bark. But as you can see from this picture, these folks have put up some tin foil, attached it to the tree, and then that's where you would spray the tangle foot or uh, put the petroleum jelly. There are also other kinds of pre-made tree bands that you can buy online or uh, other kinds of nursery stores perhaps. Um, and they're called uh, sticky bands and they, you can use those to help catch the, the caterpillars. So what are some uh, ways that you can manage your woodlot to help kind of reduce the, the damage done from gypsy moths? Well, first of all, you wanna increase your stand vigor. And we had two classes earlier. One was um, a talk from a forester. And last week was about silviculture. You know, how do you manage your woodlot? And uh, one way to um, increase the health of your woodland would be to remove diseased or damaged trees from your woodlot. And also, uh, if you have a lot of small trees, you may want to remove some of those so that you can reduce competition among your trees and give them an opportunity to grow and be healthier. 
You could also locate, you know, some of the healthier trees on your wood lot. And if they are crowded with uh, other smaller, less uh, vigorous trees, you could remove some of those and open up the canopy so that then um, your healthier tree there, your favorite tree would uh, just get the best uh, possible conditions to grow. You also may want to remove trees uh, that may provide refuges for gypsy moth larva, trees that have large dead branches or bark flaps, deep bark fissures. Um, you could consider removing oak trees uh, because they are the preferred food source for gypsy moths, but that's going to depend on your goals for your property. Um, oaks also provide mast for wildlife, so they're important wildlife habitat as well as, you know, a valuable timber species. You can try and uh, excuse me, improve predator and parasite habitats, and I mentioned that earlier. Now, if your goals for your property are timber harvest and your oaks are near to maturity um, and a gypsy moth outbreak is imminent, you may want to consider, consider harvesting your timber before the gypsy moth outbreak. So if um, perhaps you're, you're dealing with the aftermath of a gypsy moth outbreak, what you need to do is salvage your dead and dying trees and if at all possible, you want to try and remove your dead trees within the first year. Um, after that, the wood begins to uh, lose quality and you're not going to get as good a return as far as the price on those trees. Okay, moving on to emerald ash borer. This is also a non-native introduced species. And it's a shiny green metallic wood boring beetle. It kills ash trees from the genus Fraxinus. So this exotic pest was introduced from Asia. It was first discovered in Detroit um, and Ontario in 2002. It is now found in 35 states and in Washington, DC. It's spread by the movement of ash products uh, such as firewood, nursery stock, and logs. And uh, once your tree uh, has a population of uh, ash borers in it, you know, the likelihood of your tree dying is, you know, one to three years after infestation. It's a very serious pest and has killed millions of trees. So in Maryland, um, emerald ash borer was discovered in 2003 at a nursery in Prince George's County. The nursery had unknowingly accepted uh, ash trees from Michigan. Michigan, I suppose, whoever shipped it hadn't checked the trees for uh, being infested with emerald ash borer. So this caused a big problem and uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture, you know, tried to um, destroy all of the ash trees located, I forget how many miles within the epicenter, maybe a couple of miles within the epicenter. And also they hung up traps throughout the state to try and monitor the spread of the ash borer. It is now um, found throughout Maryland and has caused millions of dollars in damages to trees. And, and where this cost comes from is, you know, having to remove these trees and then replace them. So here is a uh, distribution map of emerald ash borer in the United States. As you can see, it's pretty much throughout the eastern half of the United States and uh, it has a few locations um, towards the west there. So here is um, a little slide to help you ID ash trees. Um, shows you what the bark looks like. It's you know pretty rough bark. The trees, uh, the leaves are compound leaves. They may have anywhere from five to nine leaflets on, on the the leaf, and um, the seeds kind of look like maple seeds. So here is a picture of the life cycle. These beetles have com a complete metamorphosis. So they go from adults to laying eggs to larva to pupae, which would be like the cocoon stage. <coughs> Excuse me. So the adult, um, it's about five sixteenths of an inch long. It's that metallic green. The eyes are large and kidney shaped and dark. They do tend to um, feed on the ash leaves, so they notch the leaves. 
you'll see them from May to early August and they'll mate and then uh, deposit their eggs on the bark of the ash trees. The eggs are pretty small. They're going to be really hard for you to see. They're, um, you know, about a millimeter and they are oval shaped. The larva will then hatch out of those eggs, burrow into the tree. You can see they're cream colored and um, have really delineated like segmentation. Now, when the larvae begin to feed, they uh, make what's called these galleries. And they're, what they're actually doing is they're feeding in the tissue of the tree where uh, water and nutrients are transported. So basically, as they feed and they create all these channels in the tree, they are disrupting the flow of water and food, which is going to end up starving the tree and killing the tree. Uh, this is a late stage of the larva. It forms a J shape in the tree. And at this point, it's about ready to go into the pupal um, stage, and it may overwinter in this stage. Here is the pupa stage um, is, you know, inactive during this time. Um, you're going to find these under the bark from April through July, uh, and then the adults will emerge. Now, the problem with the emerald ash borer, um, and, and you, well, you may not know that you have an emerald ash borer problem until you start to see um, branches dying in your ash tree. So you may notice, oh my, um, a third of my, the canopy of my tree has died. Ashley, did you want to ask a question? No, okay. Um, so you're not going to notice a lot of times that you have emerald ash borer until after the, the damage is done. And uh, something else you might notice are a lot of shoots or water sprouts coming out of the trunk of the tree. So what are some signs and sy symptoms besides dieback in the canopy um, and um, epicormic branching, which are the water sprouts? You may see vertical splits in the bark. You may see a D-shaped exit hole where the adults have emerged. And if you were to pull back the bark, you might see all those um, S-shaped galleries um, like this. So you can see, uh, you know, it's all kind of snake-like galleries that has been created by the larva as they were feeding. Um, these are the D-shaped exit holes. They're very distinct. Um, it's flattened on one side. And you can see the picture on the right with the emerald ash borer after it has eaten its way through the bark and has emerged. This is a picture of what the vertical splits might look like, and this is going to occur over where all the larvae are feeding underneath. And here are pictures of what dieback might look like in your canopy. This is a picture of what epicormic branching looks like. It's when you have a whole bunch of uh, sprouts that come out along the trunk of the tree. Uh, anytime you see this, this is an indication that your tree is under stress. This, this applies for any kind of tree. And this uh, is another indication. This picture was taken in winter. Uh, you get a good look at the trees at that point, and you see it looks like somebody's been scraping the bark off of the tree. Well, this has actually been caused by uh, sap suckers, which are kind of woodpecker. So that's also an indication that you have uh, emerald ash borer larvae in the tree because the sap suckers are trying to, to eat those larvae. So what can you do on your property? Well, right now it's probably not a good idea to plant ash trees. Um, if you are uh, transporting or selling ash products, you're gonna have to observe quarantines. And it's never a good idea to transport firewood, um, like if you're camping or something, uh, or selling firewood. Um, firewood should be bought and burned in the county where the person lives. Now, um, Maryland Department of Agriculture, in cooperation with uh, U.S. Forest Service, has been releasing several biological control agents, such as parasitic wasps, that attack both the eggs and the larvae. Um, so they're trying to get these, these predators um, established in, in areas across Maryland. Also, uh, there are some natural predators, uh, some wasps, uh, but um, they're not really going to keep the the emerald ash borer under control at this point. So some considerations with the ash trees that are on your property. I suspect that um, throughout Maryland, 
you know, most people's ash trees have already been hit. But if, if you do have an ash tree that is still alive, uh, you may be able to save it if um, you know, less than 30% of the, the canopy has died back it's still gonna be hard for you to do that. And what you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to get somebody to treat your tree with um, a systemic pesticide in order to save your tree. Otherwise, if your tree has already lost 50% of the canopy, 50% of the tree is dead, um, it's, it's, too, it's too late to save the tree. You're gonna to have to consider harvesting that tree, cutting it down. Also something to think about is uh, where that tree is located relative to your house or other buildings because ash trees do tend to just, the trunks just tend to snap. So they are hazardous um, once they have died. Okay, let's see. So if you do still have some viable ash trees on your property and you want to protect them, you can do that but you're gonna to have to use, apply systemic insecticides, which in Maryland, you're gonna to need to have an applicator's license. If you do not, then you're gonna to have to hire someone to do that. If you live in another state where neonicotinoids can be bought by homeowners, you can consider using a soil drench with the chemical imidacloprid or dinotefuron. Um, you can also do a, a trunk spray. Uh, trunk injections must be done by a certified uh, arborist. So you'll have to hire someone to do that. And the chemical they'll use is emamectin benzoate. Some protective cover sprays for, your, for the leaves, the canopy, which would serve to keep the adults under control would be permethrin, seven, bifenthrin, and cyfluthrin. Um, these are all the chemical names, uh, except for seven, the chemical name for that would be carbaryl. So if I want to try and treat my tree, how do I do that? So two life stages of EAB that are targeted would be the larval form and then the adult beetles. Now the adult beetles, um, basically um, they're going to emerge and it's going to coincide with when black locust trees bloom. So at that point, you know, okay, I need to treat my trees. If you're gonna use an insecticide that kills bees, um, then you're gonna have to wait to apply that insecticide till after the ash tree is finished blooming. Now, usually it blooms first and then puts out its leaves. And um, let's see, dinotefuron. Uh, the difference between dinotefuron and imidacloprid uh, when doing a soil drench or application to the tree is a dinotefuron is taken up more quickly throughout the tree because it's, it's water soluble. So uh, these are some things to consider, you know, also prices in consideration. Dinotefuron is more expensive than imidacloprid. Imidacloprid also tends to last longer. Dinotefuron needs to be reapplied every year. You'll have to read the label on the imidacloprid uh, product and see what it suggests, but um, uh, sometimes imidacloprid can last for a couple of years. Let's see. Um, application should be done in the spring as opposed to the fall. Uh, the fall applications have been shown to be not quite as effective as spring applications. So some of your silvicultural options, you know, how should you manage your woodlands? Um, you could choose to do nothing, but as I said, if you do have uh, dead ash trees, they uh, have the potential to become widow makers. Uh, so you may want to make sure that you uh, cut them down once they're dead. You may, if you have uh, ash trees that are still standing on your property and alive, you may want to reduce the population down to about 10% of total basal area. And um, if you were present with the other classes we had, uh, the, the definition of basal area is how much um, square footage your tree would take uh, at, bre at breast height. So at about four and a half feet, if you were to take a cross section of the tree, um, say that's uh, it's two square feet, okay? That would be part of the definition of what the basal area is. 
So you don't want to just take 10% of the, you know, based on the number of trees, but you also have to consider how large the trees are when deciding how many trees to take out. Um, if, if you want to try and save your ash trees, then you're going to need to treat your specimen trees chemically and you're going to need to keep it up uh, year after year. So you'll have to weigh the cost of that. And there's a great um, website here that can actually help you plan, you know, whether and you could compare costs of your management techniques. So you, you can decide whether, well, I should, it's either cheaper to cut down my trees or to try and treat them. All right, moving on to Henley, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. I'm gonna take a drink here. Okay. This is another exotic invasive pest that kills hemlock trees. It was introduced from Japan and discovered in the Pacific Northwest in 1924 and found in the Northeast in the 1950s. In Maryland, it was found in the 1980s. So this is a tiny little aphid-like insect. And it's covered with a fluffy white waxy covering, which protects it and kind of makes it impervious to chemicals. So um, it attacks both Eastern and Carolina hemlocks. It is transported primarily by wind, birds, and humans, especially, you know, equipment that might be used in forests. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Luckily, cold weather can slow down the spread of this insect. So if it's, you know, below five degrees, that can actually, <clears throat> excuse me, reduce the hemlock woolly adelgid population. This is a picture of what it would look like on um, your hemlock woolly adelgid branch. Someone brought this in to me um, for identification. And so you see all those little white balls and it kind of looks like snow. Well, that's actually, you know, where the hemlock woolly adelgid insect is, is living, or it could be egg masses. So you see, here's a close up. Uh, the egg sac is inside of that, that woolly looking white waxy stuff. <coughs> the distribution of hemlock woolly adelgid is throughout the Northeast, as you can see from the, the gray and red areas here on the map. So from Maine to Georgia, uh, into Kentucky and Tennessee, and there's some spots in Wisconsin and Michigan as well. It has caused some serious damage in our hemlock forests, especially in the south. Um, <clears throat> so the hemlock woolly adelgid is primarily found on the young branches of hemlock. It, it, what it does is attaches itself to the base of needles and it begins to feed. It sucks out the plant juices and it may also inject a toxin while doing so, which when you have a lot of them on a branch, eventually it's gonna kill the branch. So it's, it's gonna cause um, needle drop and branch die back. Uh, infested trees may die within, you know, four years or your tree can hang around in a weakened state for many years. Uh, areas that have seen some of the, the greatest tree mortality are Virginia, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. The life cycle of the hemlock woolly adelgid is pretty complicated. Um, so, it's interesting because the, the females uh, lay eggs. They don't need a male to be present. We call this parthenogenesis. So the adult females over winter, they will then lay eggs and each egg mass might have 100 to 300 eggs in it. They do this in early spring. And then the nymphs, which are the immature stage, emerge and they will then attach to the base of your needles and begin to feed. And they, um, they continue to do that till they progress through uh, four stages of development and become adults, which then again lay some eggs in Jul June and July. Those nymphs hatch out, uh, they attach to the base of needles, they become inactive for a couple of months, um, August and September, and then they resume their feeding uh, October through winter, and the cycle continues. So how do I manage for this pest? Well, there are some biological controls out there, predators and pathogens, um, pesticides that can be used. There's some 
silvicultural treatments. Um, and also uh, you should consider not keeping your bird feeders or bird baths um, near hemlock trees because birds are one of the primary carriers of this insect pest. So you wanna try and um, discourage birds from congregating near your hemlocks. So um, some of the most um, successful predators uh, are a North American beetle called uh, Laracobius nigrinus. And this can be found in the Pacific Northwest. It has been collected by Maryland Department of Agriculture uh, people and released in several spots in Maryland. And we do have uh, some thriving populations of this particular beetle, uh, which are helping to keep hemlock, hemlock woolly adelgid under control. Also, this particular beetle, which is native to Japan, uh, Sasagis gymnis suge, has been collected and released in many sites by um, USDA Forest Service. And also, I think, in conjunction with uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture in Maryland. And this is also um, making a dent in hemlock woolly adelgid populations. There is also a fungi, which has been found to uh, kill the hemlock woolly adelgid. What they're trying to do is um, find a way to propagate this and then be able to uh, apply it aerially so it can be applied to large expanses of forest. Because right now, um, there's not a really good way to protect hemlock trees. And basically, uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture and people are having to go and protect individual trees by um, applying um, systemic insecticides, and which has to be you know, done every year, every couple of years. So it's very expensive. And, um, but if they were to figure this out, it would be a great way to uh, help protect large areas of hemlock trees. So some of the pesticides that can be used to protect your hemlocks um, would be horticultural oils and soaps. Now this is difficult um, and it's gonna depend on the size of your tree. So as a homeowner, um, you would have to buy some spray equipment that would be able to reach up into the canopy of your tree. And this is just really not practical if your tree is 30 feet or taller. Um, but if applied at the right time and your tree is, um, you know, not too tall, these oils and, and soaps applied at the right time could, you know, protect your trees. So, um, and, and what you have to, you have to time it correctly because the, <clears throat> the uh, nymphs at different stages are protected by that white woolly covering. So um, pesticides are not gonna be able to penetrate and uh, kill them. So to kill adults, you're gonna to want to apply the horticultural oil in February or early March before they begin to lay eggs. Um, or in mid-June, you can spray your trees with a summer rate of horticultural oil or insecticidal soap. Now, imidacloprid and dinotephron, which we have already talked a lot about, are also um, very effective in protecting your hemlocks. These are systemic. They are also neonicotinoids, which in Maryland is uh, prohibited for use by people without pesticide applicator licenses. But the best time to apply these would be um, in early spring or late fall when you've got adequate soil moisture to um, get that chemical down through the soil for the roots to take it up and then distribute it throughout the, the tree. It can take, you know, two or more months um, by the, you know, between the time that you apply and the time that the tree distributes all that chemical throughout the, the tree. Now, as mentioned before, dinotephuron uh, works quicker, but uh, it's more water soluble. And um, if you are near water, uh, you will, will not want to use this one because you don't want to take a chance on it uh, moving into nearby water sources. Some silvicultural um, management options would be well, it's gonna depend on what your goals are for the property. Um, are, most people aren't harvesting hemlock, uh, although some people use hemlock for siding, tree siding. Um, but, you know, 
it is not really suggested that you just go ahead and preemptively cut out all your hemlock because what scientists are hoping is that there are going to be um, genetic strains of hemlock out there that are resistant to the hemlock woolly adelgid and so we want to you know we want the, to find those trees so that we can you know propagate those trees and uh, so we don't lose our hemlock forests so unless timber revenue is your main objection you know uh, or objective excuse me um, salvage is is probably not really uh, necessary uh, although if you do have a dead tree you will need to consider removing it also um, you if you are going to cut your trees you want to avoid cutting during the crawler stage which is when the nymphs are moving out and looking for a place to attach to the needles um, because at this point they could get onto your equipment and if you didn't thoroughly clean your equipment you could be uh, transporting them to different areas of your property or to somebody else's property. So uh, try to avoid cutting April through August. Do not fertilize your infested hemlocks because the excess nitrogen actually uh, has been shown to enhance the survival of, of this pest. Okay. Moving on to the spotted lanternfly. It is pretty, isn't it? But uh, this is a new one. Uh, hooray, hooray for us, right? So this is a new exotic invasive pest, uh, first discovered in Pennsylvania, 2014. Um, it's now in 26 counties of Pennsylvania. It is from Asia. Uh, it has been found now in Cecil and Harford counties of Maryland. This is neither a fly nor a moth or butterfly. It's actually a plant hopper. Uh, so it does suck the sap from the stems, the shoots and trunks of uh, fruit trees and all kinds of other trees. Um, grapevines, it likes hops. It will get on your ornamental and hardwood trees as well. Pennsylvania has done a study and they estimate that this pest is going to cost them $324 million annually. So what is some of the damage? Well, uh, it has been found feeding on Tree of Heaven, which it prefers because Tree of Heaven is also from Asia. So, um, and this pest is from Asia, so it prefers that. But it has also been found on walnut, apple, stone fruits, you know, like cherry, maple, birch, willow, oak, pines, almond, poplar, sycamore, and many others. Now, what, what this pest does is it, it tends to aggregate in very large groups on, um, on the trees or on grapevines. And they're sucking all the sap out of the trees and, or vines and it stresses the host. And some of the, the symptoms you will see would be wilting, stunted growth, leaf curling, sap oozing out, um, possibly death if it's bad enough. enough. Sooty mold is, um, as a result of uh, this insect will excrete a kind of sugary substance and then mold will grow on it. So it kind of looks like a black covering on your plants on the leaves. Now, early research suggests that um, this, is, this insect is dependent on the tree of heaven, Elanthus, for reproduction. And it's the preferred tree, host tree, for where they're gonna, that's where they're gonna prefer to lay their eggs. Here's a visual of their life cycle. Um, so you have egg masses that make it through the winter, and then you have the nymphs hatching out in April. They go through four developmental stages. Um, the first three are black with white spots. The last one is red. It's got white spots and black stripes. It will uh, molt into an adult July through September, and the adults will then lay masses on uh, on trees throughout the fall and they will die as winter begins. So here's some nice pictures of um, you know what the spotted lanternfly looks like. And we have the adults on the left hand side here. In the center you have the nymph stages, um, the black and white being the early nymph, nymph stages, you know they're about a quarter inch in size. And then uh, the final stage here, the red and black and white one is about a half of an inch. 
And then finally, we see what the egg masses look like when laid on the trees. So one way to help control this insect right now would be to remove any egg masses that you see. And each egg mass may have 30 to 50 brown eggs in it. And they're, they're interesting in that they're, they're laid, um, they look like seeds and, and they're laid in rows. And um, the freshly egg masses look like they're about an inch long and they look like they've got a covering of gray mud on them. And over time it, it will it will crack. So um, the way to destroy these, and this applies also to gypsy moth egg masses, is you could uh, put them into some isopropyl alcohol um, or burn them. You can also do tree banding to catch the nymphs, which I also went into uh, detail with gypsy moths. So you can wrap your tree trunks with this sticky tape, which can be, you know, bought pre-made. And I have seen people attach them with push pins. All right, pesticides. So Penn State is um, doing some testing on insecticides to determine which ones are most effective for controlling adults. Um, preliminary results show that um, pesticides that contain dinotefuron, imidacloprid, tau, flu flubalinate, uh, tebuconol, I don't know this one, tebuconazole. Uh, these are all systemic. They seem to be working pretty good. Um, other pesticides that work on contact would be carbaryl, pyrethrin, malathion, and bifenthrin. Neem oil and insecticidal soap can provide some control, but it's not going to be as good um, as these other chemicals previously mentioned. And they are looking in to see if the fungus Bovaria bassiana will work on the um, in, um, immature stages. And Bovaria bassiana can be purchased by homeowners. So silvicultural management. Um, because all the life stages of the spotted lantern fly strongly favor the tree of heaven, treating those trees with imidacloprid or dinotefuron or some other insecti in, uh, systemic insecticide is like one of the best ways to try to get control of this insect. Um, so what is suggested is not that you remove all your tree of heaven from your property. Now I should mention that tree of heaven is an exotic invasive as well. But in order to keep them from moving off of Tree of Heaven onto our more desirable species property and use them as trap trees. So what you would do is treat those, you know, trap trees with the systemic insecticides so that when the um, spotted lanternfly does begin feeding on them, it will kill them. Now to kill uh, Elanthus, the rest of the Elanthus, um, let's see, I think the next slide will talk about that. Um, there's a right way and a wrong way to do this. So Tree of Heaven is dioecious, which means that uh, the trees are either male or female and they are clonal. So um, you have uh, sprouts coming up from the roots and they respond vigorously to injury by sending up lots of suckers from the roots. So because of that, you should not try to cut the tree and then apply your herbicide to the tree to kill it because then it's gonna send up a whole lot of suckers. So the best way to kill a tree of heaven would be if it's small enough, you could use a foliar spray of triclopyr or glyphosate you could do a basal bark application for smaller trees um, of triclopyr 2,4-D plus pychlorum or imazapyr. You could use the hack and squirt method for larger trees, larger than six inches in diameter. So basically what that is, um, you take a, a hatchet, you cut into the tree, and then you squirt in your herbicide. And this would be herbicides that are meant to kill trees and brush. And some of the more effective chemicals would be triclopyr or 2,4-D plus pychlorum. And this should be done early spring through summer. All right, 
So how are we on time? Let me check here. Two o'clock. Okay, we're doing pretty good. I will um, continue on with the southern pine beetle and then we'll take questions. So Sherry, we're doing pretty good on questions too. We've only got a couple that have come in. So I think we're, we're in good shape. All right, very good. All right. Okay, the southern pine beetle. Now this is a native species. Um, it's native to Central America and the southern part of the United States. So this is one of the most destructive pests in pines and it causes, it can cause millions of dollars in losses for pulpwood and saw timber uh, industries in the southeast. So Maryland is at the northern edge of the range of the southern pine beetle and um, so far it's mostly been found uh, in the lower eastern shore and in southern Maryland. It can attack all pine species, but it commonly attacks loblolly and Virginia pines. So what, how does this pest operate and what does an outbreak look like? So the beetle naturally occurs at low levels uh, in pine forests. You're never gonna get rid of it, it's always there. Um, but it does tend to reproduce in weakened or dying pines. So dense pine stands with predominantly saw timber sized trees are most at risk for the um, southern pine beetle buildup. Outbreaks may develop following mild winters or hot dry springs, extreme drought. And when you have you know, populations of this beetle that are building, the outbreaks tend to be cyclic, like every six to 10 years. So what happens when a, a tree is stressed, it emits chemical signals that beetles and other insects uh, other creatures pick up one. So with the southern pine beetle, the female picks up on this chemical and she will initiate the attack. She will travel to this tree, find the tree that is stressed for whatever reason. It could be because there's been a drought. Uh, it could be because it has a disease um, and has been injured in some way through a lightning strike or maybe I don't know, so there been uh, some harvest going on on a property and the tree got injured in the process of that. Whatever the reason, it's stressed. So the female finds the tree. She then uh, puts out a pheromone that combined with the, the host chemical signals attracts both males and other females. And they all start to congregate on this tree. So um, the males and females will mate and then the female will bore into the bark and then lay eggs in an S-shaped gallery in the cambium layer, which is you know, where the, the transport of food and water is happening. So then the larvae will uh, hatch out of these eggs and they will begin mining and feeding uh, on that part of the tree where you have final the, the sap and the water flowing and this just like with the emerald ash borer, girdles a tree and ends up starving the tree and killing it. So the adults, um, old and new ones that are newly emerging, choose small holes, which you'll see in this picture to the left, uh, to exit the tree. It looks kind of like a shotgun pattern on the, the bark surface. Uh, after you, know, you have a mass emergence, it looks like it's been hit with a shotgun. The beetles um, also, in the process of feeding, uh, have this mm, blue stain fungi on their bodies, which they end up um, transferring from one tree to the next. The tree uh, then gets inoculated with this fungi, which penetrates the sapwood and also uh, serves to you know, cause the tree to die because it blocks the flow of water in the tree as that fungus develops. So see, here a picture of an infestation. And what happens is um, here on the far left where the trees are dead, this is where the attack would have initiated. And as the, a tree was overrun with beetles, um, they begin moving to adjacent pine trees. And you can see kind of the stages of, of um, infestation as you move from the left side to the right side of this photo, you have your dead trees. And then in the center, you can see the, the trees that um, 
are beginning to be attacked. The canopies are yellowing um, and turning brown and then eventually those trees are going to die. So you can see how the beetle spreads from this photo. Here's a depiction of the life cycle. So it's a, a small reddish brown beetle that's pretty, it's pretty small, two to four millimeters. It's got four larval stages and it can have three or more generations per year, which is a lot. So what are some of the signs and symptoms that you might see on your pine trees? Well, the needles of infested trees turn yellow in two to three weeks after the, the southern pine beetle has arrived on your tree. Uh, and then they're gonna turn reddish brown after a month. The surface of your trees are gonna be covered by uh, pitch tubes, which could look like small, you know, popcorn shaped uh, things that could be either light tan or it could be reddish brown. Um, also, it's often found in uh, bark crevices. And, and this is actually the, the tree's response to the beetle boring into its bark. It's trying to push out the beetle and, um, and the larvae by sending a lot of sap to where the injury has occurred, okay? And if you were to pull back the bark, you would see those S-shaped galleries underneath that's caused by the, the beetle, the adult beetle, and also the, the larvae as they develop. And you may also see evidence of the blue stain fungus um, underneath of the bark, which actually stops the transport of water throughout the tree. And you could also look for the shotgun pattern of exit holes. Now, tree death does occur rapidly. So here we have a picture on the left of the, the galleries created by the beetle. And then on the right, you, you can see um, the yellowing and browning of the, the trees, which have been not that long ago infested. So what are some of your management strategies for your woodlot? Well, um, the most effective long-term strategy for minimizing your losses to this insect would be to maintain healthy stands. Uh, you should remove any trees that have been damaged by lightning, logging, or ice. Uh, to decrease the chance of, you know, the southern pine beetle being attracted to the trees in your woodlot uh, and establishing there. So you need to do frequent monitor monitoring. Um, you want to reduce the density of susceptible trees. Um, we talked about the basal area. So you don't want your woodlot to be overstocked with trees. If it's overstocked, consider thinning that out some. And thinning is also going to increase your tree vigor, you know, how healthy your tree is. And um, doing that is going to give the tree a better ability to resist beetle attack by pushing that resin out um, to hopefully push the, the beetles out. And the most commonly recommended control method uh, is a salvage cut of the infested part of the, the forest. So remove all of your infested trees and uh, up to a 50 to 100 foot buffer of the green trees um, that are surrounding that area. Just remember that photo I showed earlier, you would wanna go 50 to 100 feet out from where that zone of attack is. And you want, as you're harvesting that timber, you should start with the green trees and then move into the dead and, and um, infested trees. Some other suppression strategies, um, if you have a problem, would be to just cut those infested trees and leave them where they lay if it's too hard for you to, to pull them out. Um, you could use chemical control, but this is not usually very practical. You could actually take the trees, pile them up and burn them. Or, um, and most of the con your control efforts should take place from late spring through fall uh, to help control the actively spreading spots. Okay, and here is a list of my sources. And so you can follow these links to get even more in-depth information on, on these different pests. 
and I think that's it, Ashley. So um, what kind of questions do we have? Okay, great job, Sherry. Thank you. Thank um, you. We really didn't get many questions at all. We had one uh, about the specific status of Cathedral State Forest and the hemlock oh. trees there. And I, I did enter that since it's about two miles from my house. Um, so they, they are doing some predatory release beetles um, there at, hem at, um, at Cathedral as well as doing some um, chemical treatments as well. Uh, so they, they are keeping a watch on it. And then the other question was, in reference to using sticky tape, and mm -hmm. should that be avoided since it catches birds, bats, and other beneficial animals? Okay, so the, I mean, there there have been some, um, you know, there is some discussion about that. You know, is it detrimental? Um, for the most part, uh, I don't think you're going to find that. I don't know. I haven't seen anything about bats being caught in it, but yes. Um, I have seen, you know, it's possible that birds could get caught in. I don't think it's very usual. Um, so you're going to have to, you know, weigh that and make the decision yourself. You know, you are the manager of your property. You you're going to have to weigh that. And, but I would say if you're concerned about that, I would definitely make sure that I check the, the sticky bands every day. You could, you know, then if there were, was a bird, there that got stuck, you could, um, you could free them. So those are my thoughts on that. Yeah, I agreed. And I, I had just typed that, you know, it, it would only be probably done on a few trees because it is very labor intensive. So like you said, to, to monitor it and the, the benefits would outweigh the, the negative aspects as long as you were, you know, monitoring it and, you know, getting good kill rates on the, the bad insect that you're trying to control. Yep, I agree completely. Okay, and other than that, I don't see any other questions. If you guys have questions, please go ahead and enter the, them into the chat. It was a very, very thorough, Sherry, and you did a great job. I know I really learned every, a couple things, and um, I think it was really good. I did put the link for our next class next um, September the 15th at 6 p.m., and the link to register on Zoom. Zoom. So if anybody's interested in that, please feel free to, to sign up. Okay. Thank you, folks. I really appreciate it. And uh, we will be sending you out an email in a day or so. And uh, this presentation uh, will be included in that in the form of a PDF. So you'll have all that information at your fingertips. And as Ashley probably said, uh, it will be up on the YouTube uh, channel. All right, Sherry, we just got one more. <clears throat> Black Locust has been sending up a lot of suckers. Any ideas why? Well, trees tend to send out suckers when they are stressed. So I'm not sure uh, where you are located, what the environmental conditions might be. If you've had a drought or maybe you've had flooding, um, ice damage, you know, hopefully not fire, but uh, some kind of injury, it may do that. I also have a black locust on my property and it, it will send out, you know, suckers here and there. I wouldn't say a lot, but every year I find a few and I don't really think it's under any particular stress, but um, you know, I think a certain number is normal, but if you are seeing a lot, then I would, uh, you, know, c you know, check out your tree and see if there's a reason why it might be under some kind of stress. Yeah, I agree with that, Sherry, as well. And I know we have some property where we have black locusts and they can almost become a nuisance uh, just mm -hmm. with putting out a lot of suckers and uh, they can almost be a, a real management headache, um, you know, but just because they can put out so many suckers and so many other trees that end up coming up there, they almost become like a weed, so. And they're yeah. not really stressed. They're just taking advantage of the open woodland area or the open sunlight. Right, and, and mine is, is in my yard. So all the suckers get mowed. So I, you know, I can see where if it was, you know, in a, another part of your property that doesn't regularly get mowed that, you know, that really could become a problem like it is for you, Ashley. All right. Okay. All right, everyone. Yep. 
Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I really appreciate it, and I enjoy talking about this subject and hope that you will join us for 